All right. Three, two, one. All right. Welcome everybody back uh, from upstairs. We're back here at the front of the African Ancestor Wall. One of the things that I've forgotten to say if someone had asked me is um, how, who did the painting. I had eight different painters that uh, I just kind of found randomly around that craft. If I see them, I see a painting of something up on a wall or under a bridge or whatever. I take the number and call them and I uh, asked them if they wanted to try it out. And you know, most of them worked out, a few of them didn't. And there's a few paintings, of course, I would like to redo and we will redo from time to time. Um, the other question was, uh, how did I choose who goes on the wall, which I meant to say upstairs. Uh, basically, what I did is I just kind of had a list of, I made a long list of attributes, everything I could think of from courage to leadership to, to uh, uh, brilliance to this to that creativity <clears throat> and uh, then I kind of started mapping people back to that so a lot of the people that you may know or you're expecting to see you won't see because hopefully I've, I've covered that attribute or characteristic in a one or two other uh, uh, paintings and um, of course there will be people that you do see and you're wondering why they're there uh, and we can talk about some of those too so that's the basic thing but it's really when the children come in there's certain things I want them to hopefully consider, learn, and internalize. And hopefully there's someone on the wall that represents that. So that's kind of how that went down. All right, so I'll start here to my right. This is, uh, uh, you want me to stand closer to the... Uh, oh, yes, uh, close is good. Yeah, okay. This is uh, Poka Kanyani. She's from uh, the northern part of Ghana, a uh, place they call uh, uh, Bukeri, which is near Bolga Tenga. <coughs> My wife is from that area, so of course I start with uh, someone from that area. But anyway, uh, Apoka Karnyani was known for having used this pestle you see here uh, that they normally pound uh, cassava and yam and all these other kind of things, millet. Uh, she used that to actually kill the lead, lead uh, of the slave raiding delegation the number one man there. When she was able to kill him, of course, that acted as a deterrent to the others. So when they dispersed, they basically didn't come back to that area, finding it inhospitable for acquiring Africans for slaves. Uh, here we go is Queen T. Uh, Queen T comes from the 18th dynasty, Egypt. She's the wife of Amenhotep III. Uh, mother or aunt of Amenhotep IV, who's also known as Akhenaten. Um, not only was she an influential queen, beautiful queen, but she was um, one of those figures in history that I think our children, especially African children, need to know about how far back some of this female leadership went. Now this is also serves as my opportunity to talk to the students who come through. I've had almost 500 students through here just this week, um, to talk to them about the black Africanness of ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet. And so this is the opportunity I used to introduce that because of course, like us, they all grew up with uh, a white Egypt and all of these, you know, uh, who, whoever it is, they drew pulling the stones and building the pyramids and inventing the language and astronomy and all of the miracles that went with Egypt always accrue to the white or non-African. So here is where I tell them about that. And of course, as we go on, I try to demonstrate to them that that's the case. So that's, um, <clears throat> so, and I think while I am talking here, although that's coming across a little left, while I am, I'll also try to give you or I, why I have them here for the students. So some people you'll know, and I want to kind of let you know why I want the students to internalize that. So here, of course, we have Marcus Garvey, as I was mentioning earlier. I'm a Garveyite, but I like to tell the students about the United Negro Improvement Association being the largest black organization the world has ever seen. I like to talk about uh, Garvey's vision in terms of uh, our potential and our potential in the world and what we need to be thinking of doing on this African continent. And um, I also like to, the fact that since he is from Jamaica, we always introduce him as an African born in Jamaica. Uh, Ghanaians have a, a, an affinity toward Jamaicans, and so that also helps. But 
I try to relay to them why Garvey is so important. And if we had followed some of Garvey's advice and visions, we probably wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. Now, Kwame Nkrumah, I normally don't have to say too much to the students about because he's the father of their country in terms of independence, <clears throat> the post-colonial times anyhow. But uh, what I do like to emphasize, especially to the teachers, is this quote that I put here. And basically, this says that, um, you know, this is a quote by Kwame Nkrumah saying, look, we talked to all these big, I've read all of these big brain Europeans, uh, Karl Marx and Lenin and all the rest, but the book that did most to fire his enthusiasm was the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey. Now, you know, this gives Garvey some context uh, for these teachers and even some of the older students because they have a, a very high regard, of course, for Kwame Nkrumah. But then they, when they find out that he was impacted so much by Garvey, that puts Garvey in some context. And also things like the Black Star Line, which of course is started uh, with Garvey, which is also something that Nkrumah brought here. So some of those examples also make it clear what the connection is. Of course, some of a lot of Garvey's, excuse me, Nkrumah's Pan-African leanings, of course, come from the philosophies of Garvey. Now the place we're standing in here, someone's asking me before, is actually not Prom Prom, it's New Ningo. And uh, so out of just respect for the, the, the local folks, we have Jonas Carbo, who's the founder of this place. But sometimes they call it Carbo Kope, which means Carbo Town. And the first chief that came in with him uh, was Tejangma the first. So we just like to pay respects to the people on, la on the land. And the time frame for when that happened? Uh, yeah, these were the turn of last century. So last century, okay. like early 1900s, like 19... 10 and 12. And of course here we got our, our flags are getting a bit frayed but we got Ghana, we have Ethiopia, Jamaica and a red, black and green. Uh, this says uh, Lea Zare which is uh, in the northern Gruni language where my wife and children and all speak this language in the home. It means welcome. It's like the Aquaba you'll see everywhere else you go. Mm -hmm. Here comes the sun. We'll knock out whatever we can knock out and then we'll get up to eat because it sounds like the food is ready. All right. Now, I always joke and say that, you know, uh, one in every four or five Ghanaian men are, are, are preachers. I'm probably not all that far off. So I usually, sometimes I get a little pushback when I start talking about Adam and Eve and have this African Eve, which, uh, you know, goes contrary to what that big stack of books they have, comic books that somebody sent them from wherever it looks like. So we talk about African Eve or Eve because we know Homo sapiens sapiens, which is our species, mm. is something around 200,000 years old. And any geneticist with a high school certificate in that knows that now. And um, so for the first 130,000 years after that, no one left the African continent. So about 70,000 years or so, Africans began to slowly trickle out, right, and populate the world. So everybody else is roughly 70,000 years or less. And of course, because of environmental factors, uh, the melanin in our skin, the activation of the vitamin D, all of those things dictate whether or not you have dark or light skin. So after 30,000 years, going toward Europe with less sun and this kind of thing, of course, they need less, they have less requirement for melanin to get the requisite amount of, you know, activation of, do um, of vitamin D. So hair and all the rest of that. But the point here is that it's Adam and Eve that all of these children, like I said, had a lot through here this week. And every last one of them will tell you that there's no Adam or no Eve that looks anything like this. And this will be the first time that it's ever pierced their imagination. Uh, next is a Chebe, Chinue Chebe from Nigeria. I know a lot of you have probably read some of his books, Ant Hills of the Savannah, Things Fall Apart man of the people, that kind of thing. So one of our great Igbo, Igbo writers. We have Brother Asa Hilliard, a lot of uh, people from the U.S. know Asa, he's a psychologist by training, uh, Pan-Africanist by, by work, uh, Egyptologist, historian, all the rest. Very, very great brother. Uh-huh, see that son, got you. Then we got 
then we got uh, Yasantawa, so some of y'all who uh, will go to uh, Kumasi or Ajisu, I don't know if that's in the trip, but if you do, oh, yes, you'll absolutely. see she's one of the queen mothers of Ajisu who is known for having struggled mightily against the British. And uh, if you're lucky, they'll recite her speech, uh, parts of her speeches to her people when she's cajoling them to get out and fight again. Uh, for a lot of Ghanaians, they'll know the name Kimathi because Kimathi is Jerry Rawlings' son, and uh, he named him Kimathi, I'm sure, because he was hoping he would follow the tradition. And we were growing up, the Kikuyu Land Freedom Army there in Kenya was called the Mau Mau, so some of y'all remember that term, used derisively. But um, they uh, did whatever they could, fighting from the bush, fighting from the forest, the rivers and mountains, to try to do something to maintain what sovereignty they could there in Kenya, among, especially among the Kikuyus. Uh, another one of our great warrior queens is in Zinga, Mbande from Angola. Now this is going all the way back to the early days of the Portuguese coming into Africa. And um, of course, uh, doing what they did uh, trying to acquire slaves, but just trying to acquire power uh, in the land itself. Uh, and Zinga pretty much spent her whole life trying to figure out how to uh, stop that uh, juggernaut of one of the first European onslaughts of African people, lands, resources, and, you know, of course, the endless search for labor. Sergeant Ajete here in Ghana, he's uh, uh, popular because he's one of the three military men who marched on the capital because after World War II, the Africans who fought, of course, for the, for the British side, the American side, uh, they were owed reparations, not reparations, but just benefits and, and this kind of thing. And of course, the British and the West reneged on those benefits after the war was over. These guys distinguished themselves in places like Burma where they pushed a lot of the Japanese out of there. In fact, they have a place here called Burma Camp uh, here in Ghana. And so when he marched on the Capitol to protest him and two other ones, they were shot and killed. That sparked the Accra riots. And the Accra riots is when uh, the, really the beginning of the end of the colonial order. That's when they jailed the uh, and crewmen and the rest of them. And, and uh, so his bravery was, we think, was kind of like the match that uh, lit the fire of independence. Maurice Bishop, you know, I had, um, Oh yeah, yeah, yesterday I had a lot of students, college students, and I won't say what university, it wasn't an HBCU, but it probably doesn't matter, uh, from the U.S. They were all college level students. And I asked them, first of all, if they'd heard of Grenada, and almost all of them said no. They said, Has anyone heard of the fact that the U.S. invaded Grenada? And none of them knew that. These wow. are college students mostly black. None of them knew, because they were all born after 1983, but this is still relatively recent history. Absolutely. None of them knew that we had invaded Grenada. No one knew uh, why we had to get rid of Maurice Bishop. No one knew about the New Jewel Movement, which is he put together, as long as it's people that, that were, of course, raising the living standards, raising the educational standards, literacy, health care, and all the rest. Uh, he threatened to be a black Cuba there in, in Caribbean, and of course, uh, the U.S. had to get rid of that whole movement because obviously that could be contagious. Trinidad and Tobago may have said, "Huh, hey, maybe we can do the same." So he was knocked out because, in our opinion, he was a threat. It was the threat of a good example. That's Maurice Bishop, lawyer by training, uh, revolutionary by profession. Uh, this. Uh, <laughs> This uh, Namatan or Amazon warriors that we've been had on this wall for a long time, since the beginning. Uh, these are the sisters who uh, were <laughs> behind Bahanzan and some of the other kings at Dahomey, which is Benin, and the uh, Ahomey uh, uh, Franco Wars. Of course, they were fighting against the French, uh, the anti colonial uh, battles. And so these sisters were trained first in security, then they ended up uh, getting up to the rank of. Um, first-rate fighters and frontline troops and very, very uh, well respected by the French and others who would write, a, write and talk about them. Now there's been a movie called The Warrior King, which I haven't seen, but 
coming from LA, my trust is very low. One reason I don't haven't seen it. One reason I haven't seen it is because I don't like public enemies. They so can't trust them. And I've seen little clips in there, and I'm like, what, what, what's going on there? Yeah, some movies are pushing, you know, push the agenda, but uh, yeah. people can. But, but that, know, that should I encourage. Guess, that should yeah. should encourage yeah. the rest of us to do some research yeah. because right. it's still right, a movie. Right. It's always a movie. Yeah. yeah. They put it out there. <laughs> You know, someone, the sister was talking about, sister, you were talking about what should you tell the black men? You know, we're talking about ba yeah. black men coming. And I keep noticing is like these, all these movies with these African women doing courageous things, which is a wonderful thing. But it's like, you know, and then this movie, they had some guy, I didn't see it, but I saw the trailer and I thought it was a European. And they, they no, 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 he's, you know, half this, half that. I mean, they couldn't find no just full up brothers to play that part. You know, that's Hollywood, yes. right? So always gotta be some compromise, you know. Push that. But anyway, don't don't get me talking about the movies. Uh, Everywhere Mont Blyden, St. Thomas, of course, and also in the Caribbean Island, in the Virgin Islands, and uh, he really was one of the pure fathers of Pan-Africanism, you know. Africa for the Africans, he had a book by that name in the late 1800s. I mean, so this is before Garvey, uh, this is before Nkrumah, this is before a lot of the... Of course, he ended up being uh, just very brilliant, so he was in Liberia. After he moved there, he contributed uh, academically. He was a diplomat, even ran for president. And, of course, the book that a lot of people know by him is uh, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race. So if you get a chance to read that one, you do it. But that's by... And if you look back at John Henry Clark, and you look back at... Um, uh, Wallace, uh, uh, Willis Huggins, you look at a lot, they started the Blyden Society back there in Harlem in the early part of the last century, uh, studying uh, not just this man, that's the name of the society, but African history and trying to get something written, published, and available to the people. So Blyden's been impacting the Pan African uh, movement for a long time. Every time I bring students here, every time, this is going on six years now, I ask them, do they know? about apartheid. Have they ever heard of apartheid? And I'm betting about 0 for 99, maybe one. There's one school, and I'm not exaggerating. I've had lots and lots of schools through here. Like I said, three or four just this week. One school, the kids, several of the children raised their hand, which meant their teacher taught them. But not because it was in any of the curriculums. Not, whether you have the international curriculum or the Ghana education system curriculum, you'll never know anything about apartheid. Yeah. Now this is recent African history. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what it is, no idea what happened. When I explain it to them, they have a real quizzical look. And half the teachers don't know. So this ain't just the children. So the teachers don't know. And some of the older ones who are, you know, were just were just by osmosis, you know, if you're over a certain age, you at least had to hear the word somewhere if you were, you know, sentient. But they really don't have any idea. So anyway, I have to go through that before I can tell them about Stephen Biko being anti-apartheid, black consciousness movement, and all the rest. So I won't dwell on Biko anymore. Of course, he was killed by South African security uh, forces. Sony Ali, of uh, ancient some guy, you know, we got Ghana Mollis, Mali Song guy, and a lot of the children here aren't aware that the reason this place is called Ghana is after one of the ancient West African empires called Ghana. Uh, so that's even in, a piece of information that a lot of some of the students won't have. But anyway, uh, the founder of Songai, the largest and the most and the last of the great West African empires. A lot of times he doesn't get the press he deserves because, of course, we had a lot of Arab chroniclers who did not like the way he practiced Islam because, of course, he's an African first, and uh, that was a problem. The Hans and I just mentioned the warriors who were fighting against the French there in Dahomey. The uh, they call him the Great Shark, and uh, you always see the pipe going. Uh, now that I've talked to the students about apartheid, I can talk to them a little bit about um, uh, Mary Makiba, of course, a lot of people will know the, the songs. And some of the children will even have heard Pata Pata or something from their parents or grandparents. Uh, but they don't know anything about her being a, another anti-apartheid 
a fighter and how she was kicked out of the country for basically three decades uh, because the white power that be didn't like her impact and influence on people through music with an anti-apartheid message. So she still did her best, even outside of Africa, uh, to bring awareness and even resources in that fight. She got the job, uh, I think, uh, uh, fortunately he's becoming a household name. <laughs> Not quite, but I mean he's on his way because more than anyone, he and Theophilo Benga, I think, demonstrated beyond any shadow of a doubt the black Africanness of ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. You know, a lot of people may remember in 1974 they had the conference, the UNESCO conference, about the peopling of Egypt. He and Obinga brought all their evidence, and I mean, of course, for some of us who've been looking at it, it's massive. Um, and easily won the argument about Africans being the ones who peopled Egypt, black African civilization. And uh, the interesting thing is, even though, even reading the results from the report, it, they state very clearly, you know, Obenga and, and Sheikh Ante Jup were ones that were really prepared and no one else could really challenge their information. So you think when they spanked them at the formal United Nations conference on the people of Africa, the people in of Egypt, that would have had some impact. Uh, you, you would be wrong. Because nothing changed and they just put all the same propaganda out and our children are still eating it up. But we know better and it's our job to make sure this kind of information is correctly put out for our, our students. Uh, Dessaline, uh, we'll talk some about um, uh, Toussaint Louverture too, but this is where I introduced the Haitian Revolution to the students and explained to them how not only the British Army, but the French Army, Napoleon, who one thing I always say, these schools teach them a lot of European history. So it won't be uh, uncommon for the students, especially at the kind of junior and senior level high school level to know about Napoleon and call him the greatest general and all of this kind of stuff. So when, once we lay that out, I said, yeah, he was the greatest, well, maybe the second greatest because the Haitians kicked, kicked us behind. These Africans kicked him out of Haiti, kicked the British out too, and established a black republic right there. And also had the decency to give the natives, Arawaks, uh, who called their place Haiti, and of course, the French call it Saint Domingue. And when the Africans took over, Desolé said, "We are now again Haiti." Of course, the fate of the the Native Americans was not very good at that point. They'd been skinny down to, uh, you know. But at least we had the decency to recognize the or original name. <laughs> yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I guess it was. One of the students, I showed him George Washington Carver. And he says, I know him, I know him. And I said, oh, you do, who is he? First president of the United States. I said, I said, you know the first president of the United States was black? Then he started scratching his head. He said, Obama? I said, no, no, you're saying the first was George Washington Carver. And then he kept staring at it. I said, did you hear the Carver part? No, George Washington. George, first president of the United States. I said, no, no. George Washington Carver. And then we end up getting into a short discussion on names, which I normally goes later on in the presentation. But anyway, as we know, uh, George Washington Carver was the agriculture genius of the day. Really no peer. Um, many of you have been to Tuskegee and seen his work. Uh, I think they've closed that museum, but someone said they're refurbishing, so hopefully it's back open. You can see what he did with uh, crop rotations and soybeans and, of course, peanuts and all the rest. Uh, Julius Nerere, we consider one of our very best all-around long-term leaders. Not only did he try to infect his people with the feeling of uh, mutual cooperation, love, respect, and, of course, a lot of the things that we say in Kwanzaa, the Swahili words having to do with uh, um, collective economics, having to do with creativity, he tried to make that actually part of his governing system. I see we need some umbrellas out here today. Yeah. And uh, not only that, of course, he really, really worked hard trying to uh, support a lot of the other frontline states who were trying to get their freedom down in the southern part of Africa. And of course, in on the beginnings of the organization African Unity and much more. Ephraim Mamou, he's a, a airway man from Ghana here from Peki, 
And uh, he's basically known, a lot of the children know him for the, the anthem that he sings, but he was also well known for, you know, doing everything humanly possible to blunt the, the ongoing uh, assault of Western culture. Uh, of Western culture and all of that, maintain the African culture. So the dress, the language, the singing, all of those things, the musical instruments, he always gave a priority. Harriet Tubman, uh, of course, we know Harriet Tubman, uh, but uh, for them, this is when I started finding out how little they knew of the African slave trade and, uh, of course, our experience of slavery there in the U.S. and in Americas. Uh, I tell the story just about every time I come through here, which, as I say, there was one time the children were, I told them about us being slaves and our, spending our lives doing this. And then I was two or three uh, pictures down, and the children were still over here talking. And I got a little annoyed, so I said, hey, hey, what's going on? You guys come on down. And I said, teacher, I said, what's going on? And she said, well, they're, they, they, they're confused. I said, why? She said, because they thought you said that you weren't paid during this time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They were upset because, they weren't upset, they were confused because I said that we weren't paid. And you know, that wasn't their understanding of what black folks had going in the Western Hemisphere all of this time. So we getting that check every Friday for 400 years, I should have something to show for it. So we had to actually clear that up. So, you know, this is the miseducation or lack of context that a lot of these children were working with. I met you. I met that guy. Samora Michelle, yeah. a friend of yours. What, what, what no, that's you, a friend. I met him. You met him? Yes. What, but since you met him, what would you say about him? Well, he, he's a very radical guy. He, he was saying in Jamaica that you don't kill the alligator alone. You crush the eggs. Uh -huh. That on new alligator barn, you know. Yeah. So a lot of people in Jamaica or on the other side were sort of upset with that. It was with Michael Manley time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. At the same time, I met Nairi Yeah, okay. Really. Well, yeah. Samara Michelle yeah. Mozambique, he was a nurse by training and once again a revolutionary by uh, by nature, I think. And uh, of course, he was leading his men against the Portuguese. He was a protege of uh, Eduardo Manlani. Uh, of course, we think or we know his plane was probably shot down, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at the behest of the uh, South African government. Mm -hmm. Nereri also was one that helped him launch, yeah. you know, his attacks against the Portuguese from the southern part of uh, Tanzania. As one example, Nereri's support for frontline revolutionary movements. Nanny of Jamaica, I hear some heavy Jamaican accents here, mm -hmm. so, uh, but we like the children to know uh, about the continuity, because since she's born in Ghana, ended up as a slave and I always ask them, do you know how she got to why how and why she got to Jamaica and they kinda wouldn't guess and that's when we have to talk about the slave trade again. But once she was there, of course what she did as a maroon queen and uh, making sure that uh, the people continued to get off the plantations. Of course she had enough power to where the British finally had to give her a small section of the island and I think you all from Jamaica there, I think it's still, is it Nanny Town, Nanny District, Nanny something? Yeah, and then, and even a Champong, which is a Ghanaian Akan name, is there. Of course, you have Kujo, which is another one of your natural heroes. They have uh, Chamiteng, which uh, is a, the guy running for president on the NPP side this time is Alan Chamiteng. So these names are still, still in the system, even in Jamaica today. Yes, ma'am. And also, after um, Samora and Michelle, he passed away and stuff, that's who um, Nelson Mandela married, his wife. Yeah, he married, he married. Uh, Gracia. Gracia Michelle, right. right. Of course, we have uh, Ali Selassie, uh, Rastafari. <laughs> you know, the leads to Farai McConan as a baby, Rastafari McConan earlier, and then, of course, Ali Selassie when he was taking the, you know, the crown. And so it's kind of interesting because a lot of the children here, when they, or young people in general here, Rasta, Rastafari, mm -hmm. they don't really have any connection with the name or what it is. And uh, of course, you know, everything humanly possible to keep Mussolini and those from finally coming in and colonizing, finishing the work that uh, they couldn't finish against uh, Menelik. And so he had to struggle against them. And that's one of the first times we've really shown some real pan-African solidarity too because people were coming from other places in the world to support 
Haile Selassie and the Ethiopians against the Italian's second onslaught. Uh, some people think he saved the, the essence of the crown uh, because of the people he was in competition with when it was actually time to move on to be the president. He had some people close by who were really more leaning toward Islam. Uh, he brought it back to their traditional uh, roots. Pianchi. Pianchi, of course, says, uh, I really like this picture because although it's a drawing, we're trying to make the point very clearly to the youngsters that this pharaoh, who's a pharaoh of the 25th dynasty, first pharaoh of the 25th dynasty founder, uh, this was 714 <coughs> BC, which means uh, at least a couple of thousand years have gone by, right? in uh, Egyptian or Kemet uh, dynasties. So when the children see this picture of this black man and know he's a pharaoh, that's kind of the first time in their minds they begin to see something that looks different than what they had in their, their textbooks. So this is always important, not just explaining it to them, but really that likeness. And then of course we close the show when we go down here just a little bit. Of course we got Shaka the great Zulu king. Uh, you may not felt he was so great if he was one, you were one of the people being incorporated into his, uh, <laughs> you know, into his kingdom. But uh, part of building that strong kingdom was part of what made the Zulu nation uh, defensible and gave it its strength. Of course, if you've seen the movie and things, they talk about how he revolutionized some of the warfare and that kind of thing. Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, I tell the children here, it's like when I was their age, uh, for my parents, voting was a very, very difficult thing, if not impossible. Uh, this is always catches the Ghanaian children by surprise, too, because they see our place as the virtue of democracy, and they can't imagine that any time in anyone's memory there would be a problem voting for black people in the country, especially now that they had seen <coughs> Barack Obama as the president. You know, so. It's, 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 uh, they give me this, look at, to me with kind of this jaundiced eye, even the, even the teachers, like, you can't tell me y'all were having trouble voting. Absolutely. And then, of course, she was tortured and jailed and beaten and all the rest just for seeking the franchise for African people. But the number one attribute for Fannie Lou Hamer is courage. Okay, we can, uh, I don't know how far, we can do a few more and then... Let's finish the big ones. Okay, we'll go through the big ones because I... See people are, that are scattering just a little bit. Okay, uh, Togbe C the first. Uh, if you come from, uh, if you're if you're an Ewe coming from uh, Togo and coming from that side, and you're on the southern part, uh, this man is the one who is credited for having brought these people down from a place called Norte, which is the northern part of Togo. And uh, these are the Ewe or the Anlo people of the Ewe. Uh, Ambo division of the airways. When I ask people, airways here, who should I choose to represent them? I got more people saying uh, Tokbe Sri than anyone else. Uh, King Taki Tawia, he's of, of the Ga group, Ga Machi. He was uh, at the turn of the last century when the whole colonial process was really kicking in. He was there trying to, you know, maintain some level of sovereignty for his people, the Ga people. Uh, in Accra and Osu and all the way through, all the way up this part of the coast. Um, you can still see the sat still see his statue down there, Makola Market, <laughs> big statue there, but uh, you can imagine the pressure he was under trying to modernize and also trying to def uh, protect his sovereignty and just <laughs> keep something together in the face of the uh, scramble for Africa and the British onslaught. Uh, right here, uh, what I always do in this case is I, I take one of the children and I know I ask all of the students, I say, you guys choose someone in your whole group that looks the most like Minis or Narmer is the other name. So they look around and they choose and they talk and they argue and they finally choose someone, usually someone pretty close. And then I have him stand there and he stands there and he crosses his arms, you know, like he's holding the, uh, uh, the staff and the thing there. And then they t usually take pictures of them and everything. So after they laugh and talk and do their comparisons, I send them back. And I said, now guess who this is? And of course they don't know. And I say, I told you Kemet was what? Ancient Egypt. Now I've told them that a few times now. So the ones that are listening say, that's Egypt. 
This is the very, and we know this is the real head because it's some large, you know, carved basalt, basalt stone in one of the European museums. And it's the very first pharaoh of the very first dynasty of ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. Now the children are like, ah, wow. And then I look back at the teachers and they're more like, come on, man, don't be stretching it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, because this is how deep it goes. You know what I mean? They, they don't even want to psychologically because they will entertain the idea that this thing they've been raised with their whole lives that's Charlton Heston and Ewell Brenner and all the rest of them. They done seen that movie 500 times. Now here I bring this guy and say this is the first pharaoh. But like it or not, there it is. And they did, we've already determined he was an African because we found an African boy who looks just like him. So it really is an exercise <laughs> that we enjoy doing with the youngsters. Uh, Cabral, somebody was talking earlier about the Guinea-Bissau. And was it you saying that you had been to Guinea-Bissau? Uh, not yet, but that's part of my uh, mother's lineage. Ah, okay, but part of your people. lineage, okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, Guinea-Bissau, mm -hmm. Cape Verde, those are Portuguese colonies struggling against, uh, like I said, the Portuguese during colonial times. Cabral was probably, I would say, if not one of the best, the best all-around leader we had. I mean, between his, uh, his military prowess, his intellectual prowess, his cult use of culture in terms of uh, empowering his people, just his long-term vision, his writings, all of those things. Uh, and more than any single person, he, he would have to be credited at collapsing the Portuguese regime. And when the, when the Portuguese, because it was like their Vietnam, they're losing so many people, they're losing money, they're losing all of these things, they're just sinking into this place. These Africans are winning this war. And finally, the young people in Portugal are going, look, you know, we're going broke, we don't have anything here, all the money's going out, we're losing soldiers. Enough is enough. And that really collapsed the Portuguese regime. So they had the 1974 uh, revolution right after he was killed. And uh, they had to release all the rest of their uh, Angolan, uh, I mean, rest of their Portuguese colonies. So Mozambique, Angola, of course, Guinea Bissau, Cape Verde, all liquidated as far as uh, being <coughs> in the hands of the Portuguese. And of course, I do the same thing here too. I usually put one child, let him choose a child, and he stands there, holds his hands up, and looks like Imhotep. They laugh and take pictures. Then I ask them, do they know who Imhotep is? Of course, they don't. Of course, we know he's probably the world's first known multiple genius. Uh, not only an astronomer, not only a mathematician, not only a poet and a scribe, uh, but of course, the world's first known medical doctor. And you know, we have all of that the procedures and things that were in his the papyri to demonstrate that. So, and the, even though Hippocrates gets the name Father of Medicine, I think we remind them and they take the Hippocratic Oath, the one referred to inside is Asclepius, which the Greeks will tell you is Imhotep. So even they are basically saying this is, you know, the godlike figure who set it all off. So that's good for the students to understand that part of their potential as they're coming up. Uh, my man came back to work on this again. Toussaint Louverture, I think he's gonna do some stuff in the margins, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, of course, Toussaint Louverture uh, was the leader of the Haitian Revolution, a uh, leader by, uh, by nature, you know. They call him an old man when he started, because when he first came on the scene, he was already about 50 years old, which to us sounds young now. But back then, that was an old guy coming on the scene, but he commanded. Uh, he manipulated, he did everything he could. But at some point he realized the Europeans could not be trusted, which is something he should have held on to. But at the time he realized they couldn't be trusted in terms of uh, what they were supposed to do. But the Africans there, he finally turned and said, well, now we have to fight. So he organized, organized and organized, trained, got them ready. And of course the rest is history, the Haitian Revolution. Uh, if you come from the north of the country, uh, like my wife and them, uh, the figure who is probably most dominant is called Nagbewa. Nagbewa was uh, the father of, of a whole lot of different nations, whether you're Mamprusi, Dagomba, Moshi up in Burkina Faso, a lot of the other ones who always have come down through like the, uh, the genetic line of Nagbewa. And of course, you all will see more about this, Fosei Tutu the first, 
who's the first king of the Ashanti, or first Ashantihini. And um, uh, there's a story I'm sure you'll hear about it, about a confa noche and the golden stool descending down, which got to be a representative of the heart and soul of the Ashanti Empire. Okay. So, yes, okay. my brother, so let's break for lunch. Take a little break, have a little lunch, and we'll pick it up when we get done. And there you go, family. All right, the journey continues, you. and we're going to pick up from Thomas Sankara. Yeah, I went down there three times. 